In this episode, I interview David Sumpter, who is a professor of applied mathematics at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. He's originally from London and grew up in Scotland. He's the author of a, a wonderful book called The Ten Equations That Rule the World. I don't know if you, the listener, are aware of my amateurish and very basic enthusiasm for mathematics. I'm a big fan of a YouTube channel called Number File, and there's another YouTube channel called 3 Blue One Brown. And I, I think that most of us are really undereducated in mathematics. I think that mathematics has extraordinary power to explain so much, and we still, all of us, don't use it enough. And uh, David Sumter's book, as well as a conversation or anything that he does, really helps us to see the world more clearly. There's an Economist article that I'm hugely influenced by that showed, they were looking at research that showed how greater achievement in mathematics is correlated with higher income and higher well-being, both across countries and within countries. So I'm a huge believer in mathematics. My enthusiasm for the subject and for David kind of turns into gush uh, at various points in the interview, and I hope you don't mind that. I'm maybe a frustrated or in a different version of my life, I might have been a mathematics student, if not professor. In the podcast, we also talk about YouTube algorithms and Google, the traveling salesman problem. Uh, we talk a little bit about string theory. We talk about symmetry and sets. We talked about David Shapiro and Jordan Peterson, believe it or not, Bayes' theorem and also vaccination. So we cover all sorts of practical areas. And if anything, I hope that it just gives you a sense of my enthusiasm for mathematics, even though it's not something that I do full time. Enjoy. I'm in awe because I was a good mathematics student when I was at high school. I was at school in the mm. UK. I was doing double maths, physics, chemistry at A-levels. I, I sort of said that is too boring, and I ended up switching for German, and that made it difficult for me to do further maths. But I loved the mathematics that I did, and my entrance exam to study law at Oxford was in mathematics. And I'm kind of really sad that I gave it up. And actually now a friend of mine here in Zurich, at the University of Zurich, is a guy called Ashkan Nikabali. Now, he's a pure mathematician, and mm. we get together and we have discussions about things. And I watch things like Three Blue... What is, what is the name of the website? Three Blue, One Brown, I think you yeah, must know that brown, website. Yeah, Three Brown, Two Blue. Now, I've, I've forgotten. Yeah, I've, 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 yes. <laughs> that guy is amazing. He's just unbelievable. Yeah. And I used to watch more number file in any case. So you can see... So I'm a guy who's armed with a little knowledge, too little knowledge, <laughs> and an awful lot of enthusiasm. And so I, I, I actually want to, I guess the first question that I'm going to ask you is, why applied rather than pure mathematics for you personally? For me personally, I mean, it's interesting you say you were so, you know, you were so into mathematics when you were younger, because I was not really a mathematics hotshot in that way. And I've never been completely comfortable in that pure world of abstract mathematics where you, you just prove things. So for me personally, it was always applied mathematics that that was what drove me. Um, I think I sort of saw patterns in things. So when I was a kid, I used to like how many, I'd, I'd look at the, the last uh, letter on the number plate, which indicated the year at that time in Britain. And I'd collect histograms of those last letters of the number plate. And I was completely fascinated by the, by the distribution of those things. And that wasn't something we learned about in school. It wasn't until I was at university that I started to learn about those different types of distributions. You, and you can actually describe a histogram with mathematics. And that was when it really caught me. So I think for me, when it's the, you know, why am I, why am I applied an applied mathematician and not a pure mathematician? It's really because I, I started with the applications. You know, I was really into computer programming from like eight or nine. And I had this computer and I just started programming and so the bottom line is that you have a an empirical uh, oriented mind and not an unempirical mind. I guess is what you would say. Is that right? I, I th yes, I, I think that's that's pretty much correct. And then I found more. So I actually, when I went to university, I went to study computer science because I thought it was computing I was interested in. Yeah. But I soon found that that was wrong because computing was like more well, it's programming and things like that. 
while I saw that mathematics was more about the underlying structures. And so that's how I got more and more drawn to mathematics. And then I found when I was at university, I was quite good at it. In fact, I have to do this now. I can only solve a problem if I have a physical explanation. And if I, I can see what it's modeling, right. then I can actually start to, to solve the mathematical problem behind it. I have had your book for a while and uh, I, you know, mm. I, I did the classic maybe undergraduate thing, which was that I was cramming it for the last hour and a half. <laughs> and I have to say, it's okay. I'm not, I'm not going to test you now. So <laughs> well, you, <know. laughs> uh, you might not test me, but I, I still want to make you feel like it was a worthwhile conversation. <laughs> and you put a lot of effort into writing the book. And, you know, I was thinking that I'd be familiar with quite a lot of what was in there. And I was not mm. familiar with quite a lot of, I mean, Bayes' theorem, I, I, I'm vaguely familiar with that. But I think that it's actually a book that requires, you know, careful study. In fact, I would have enjoyed you giving me problem sets at the end of each chapter because it's only when you do the problem <laughs> sets that you fully understand them. Actually, maybe you can do that as an addendum or in yeah. the next edition or something for, for, I don't know what you call me if I'm a nerd or not. Actually, but. you know, that's, that's very, so we're just now talking about a website to have exactly that type of thing, because I have a lot of code and problems that I've solved in connection to the book. And we're actually talking now about having a um, some form of website related to it. So I have a web developer that I'm talking to about that. So, you know, uh, knowledge for or, or studies for the longest time was becoming subdivided into narrow and narrower areas. Mm -hmm. And it kind of what your book is doing is it's saying, you know what, you're an idiot if you don't approach the world. <laughs> armed with these things and actually mm. you don't have to be a university level mathematics professor but just a little bit mm. of this knowledge is going to help you to think far more clearly about the world and to quote somebody that i'm a huge fan of charlie munger uh you know without these mm. things you're a one-legged man in an ass kicking contest is what he <laughs> would say and he, he famously says that but I want to jump, mm. I want to stay just a little bit with pure mathematics just for a second i'm i'm, mm. I'm just curious so you know, so one of the, these books, one of the books that Ashkan gave me to read was, you know, on the Riemann hypothesis, the famous Riemann mm -hmm. hypothesis, and the zeros of the Riemann, the zeros of the zeta function fall on whatever it is, the plus a half or minus a half, I don't remember. And mm. that is about as abstract as you can get, because somewhere we know it's related to prime numbers, but, and I guess that that, in a certain way, it leaves you cold, you sort of have this empirical connection to the world. And what the hell is that about? I can understand that people are interested in, in you know, those very abstract theories. Yeah. But for me, I have to have something that relates it back to an application in for the real me world. to become really, really burned for it. And I'm sort of, sometimes I have to be honest, I'm quite critical, and I, I kind of hint at this in the book, I'm quite critical of mathematicians who talk about the beauty of mathematics. And they say, look at how beautiful this shape is. And therefore, we should somehow you know, love mathematics because it's beautiful. It's beautiful to them, right? Yeah. And it's beautiful to a few other people. But yeah. there's lots of other things that are beautiful that aren't mathematics. Right. And I don't think that you can argue for why mathematics is important just based on beauty. Right. And that it really appealed to you intellectually. Yeah. Because you have to also base it on that it can be applied and it can be used. And so I, I make a few little digs, you know, yeah. in, in the I take the golden ratio, for an example, because yeah. the golden ratio is one that really fascinates people. And it, it does appear in some important places. But at the same time, a lot of the relationships you see in the golden ratio are just pure coincidence. Right. It's not that there's a deep mathematical reason. The deep mathematical reasons actually lie in the applications right. and the fact that you can apply and use combine the equations with the data. I, I, I loved physics as well, by the way, and I love the application mm. of maths to physics. The mathematics that we use in physics describes our world, but in a certain way, mathematics goes way beyond it because it doesn't just describe our world, it describes all possible worlds that can be yeah. described by mathematics. And you're kind of saying, yeah, well, that's fine, but let's just stay with this one. Of course, when we get to, and I don't <laughs> want to, I'm, I'm just diving into areas I don't really understand, but... As I understand mm. it, there are about 500 different versions of string theory, and the mathematics mm. is extraordinarily difficult. But and of course, we may never find out which of those 500 different theories is correct because we'll never be able to test it against reality. So I, 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 there's just one area of pure mathematics before we go into your 10 equations. I can't say fascinated, but the whole concept of symmetry 
and group theory. Mm. And you know, so what I do, David, is that when I'm having a particularly difficult time, I'll I'll go and get maths textbooks. And mm. somehow, you know, it's you know, it, I I mean I can't read past the first cra- paragraph and I'm lost. But somehow mm. trying to understand that calms me when I'm going through a difficult emotional period mm. or something. And I don't know if, if you know if you're able for me uh, you know, standing on one leg in three minutes to tell me what the key is to being able to get through one of those books on group theory. I mean, those whole textbooks on, you know, Lear algebra. You know, like, mm. how, where does one start? I, mean, I, I think, so I would start with graph theory, actually. If I was to take, you know, where you should start, if you want to get into a kind of area of pure mathematics yeah. and you want to sort of have a way that you can grasp what the problems are about so when you solve them i think something like graph theory looking at shortest paths right traveling uh, salesman yes yeah the the traveling salesman is one example i mean unfortunately you don't want to start with that because that's sort of an unsolvable problem (laughs) but (laughs) but that is one thing you can do is like map map between these unsolvable problems that was one of the things i i was totally fascinated by when i studied it as an undergraduate the fact you can take the traveling salesman problem and you can map it to this satisfiability problem, which is a logical problem. Right. And you map all of these problems together and you show that if you can solve one, you can solve them all. But actually, it turns out that it takes infinite time, basically, to solve even one of them once you get a, a large enough version of the problem. Right. So that that's, might be the end point for that thing. But I would start with Newman, for example. Um, what's his first name? He's got John. this brilliant book called Graph Theory. John uh, von Mark Newman. Newman. Oh, okay. um, it is. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the Mark John Newman. von Newman. Mark, okay. <laughs> no, 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 Newman uh, <laughs> with an N-E-W. See, I know, uh, I know the names not... of some mathematicians. I, <laughs> do I count as a nerd, David? Do I count? <laughs> Would I get a place on yeah. your course? Well, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good way to start, I think, that doing those types of problems. You're probably starting too high if you're getting out the Lie algebra. Yeah. Book. Also, yeah. I think... I honestly believe for some of these things, because there's no application or because you have to go so deep into an application, it's very hard for us just to get a handle of them in the first place. Right. And so that's why I'd recommend, because I, I, it's not that I'm against pure mathematics, but graph theory is one of the most intuitive ones where you need the least machinery, uh, like the least technical machinery, and you can do some kind of fun things. I discuss, I mean, in the 10 equations, I, I talk a little bit about graph theory. I look at the the Google algorithm, yes, um, yes. where they, they do a, a random walk yes. on a graph, and then by doing a random walk, they can find out who's the most popular person on yeah, the network. Yeah, that, that's the uh, that's number five, the matrix or network, and you got the yeah. infinite. Um, I love that. I actually, I think I, intuitively, I understood it. Yeah, t- talk some more about it. <laughs> no, well, I think there the, the ground idea really is that you just um, you just do a random walk. So imagine you're walking around a street. And you just every time you come to a junction, you just take a random path and you end up taking your entirely walking around the town at random. Now, if somebody's watching you do this, then they'll see you taking a particular path. And some roads you always go back to. And because you go back to those roads, you'll end up coming on those roads more often. And so what Google do is they do the same thing on the Internet. They hop from site to site. And they look how often they spend on different sites by following the links in and out of the sites. And that alone allows you to find what the most popular sites are. And I call it the influencer equation. Yeah. But not only that, there's then that that's a very time consuming process. If you wanted to find out the shortest way somewhere just by walking around randomly, it will take a long, long time. But there's another and this is where there's some kind of nice mathematics that you can then set that up as a matrix where you hop between the different and the matrix describes the connections between the roads or the connections between the people. And by finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, which are the sort of characteristic properties, again, this is a a straightforward mathematical operation, but you you find these eigenvectors. And then that the leading eigenvector, the most important eigenvector, that tells you the most important people. And yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't, actually, I don't think I use the eigenvalue, eigenvector terminology in the, in the book. You didn't, but I, I but... explain the steps for how you, how by multiplying this matrix over and over again, you end up finding who the most popular people are in the, in the so, internet. And, and Google, I mean, this is, this is Google's idea. That's, that's pretty much all that's of their it. idea, which made yeah. them billions and billions of dollars. Yes. So you've got the matrix 
And then you've got the thing that you multiply it by. What did you call that? I don't remember. There's a name for it. What you're essentially doing is you're multiplying the matrix over and over again by itself. And that's what creates the random walk. And what you do mathematically is you calculate something called the eigenvalue. So this, right. is, this is from German um, as well. So this is the characteristic value. Right. And there's one, one of these values which is bigger than all the others. Right. And if you find the eigenvector associated with that eigenvalue, then that tells you who the most important people right. are. So you find the largest eigenvalue, and that characterizes the most Im important people. Yeah, and then, the, so the, um, I, I really enjoyed, well, it was towards the end of the book, and as I told you, I was cramming it, but um, mm. the advertising equation. Well, why don't you, you know, I'm, I'm all excited to be talking to you, and I, I just tell you, mm. for, for your interest, I'm, I'm 55 years old, I'm probably more than halfway through my career, and I'm, I'm asking myself questions like, um, you know, do I want to die not having understood some things? Actually, uh, just for your, to, to make you happy and to get into applied mathematics, what comes out from your book is that I say, I, I think that even without talking to you, I would have the conclusion of, you know, Guy, you're so enamored with all these um, uh, beauty and theoretical things but actually, you consider yourself to be a mathematical mind, but there's some things here that if you just spent a little bit of time doing some problem sets, if, mm. I, if I, Guy Spears, spent a little bit more time doing some problem sets, I would have better clarity in thinking empirically about the world. And that really is the most profound message of your book. And um, yeah. uh, my, the where I diverge, perhaps, and it looks like you're um, fixing it, is that I, I'm telling my children who are teenagers that it's not enough to understand the idea. You have to do hundreds of problems before you've really kind of put them into your wiring, so to speak. So I'm all enthusiastic mm. to do the wiring, all of that. But mm. just to go to the advert, well, so so pause. Why don't you explain to the listener who hasn't heard the book? Because I know you've done this multiple times. Tell us about the advertising equation. The basic idea of the advertising equation is that you find correlations between the things that people like. And this is what Facebook did when they, and you know, we talked about the Google equation, this was the Facebook equation really, is that they just had this massive database of the things that people liked. They would like a lot of things and they would, maybe one group of people, I suppose men in our age, they like cars, they like a sort of certain type of music. And then what they do is that they then find a correlation between the things that we like. So, and then by correlation, I mean that basically this is just a, a matrix of ones and zeros of things yeah. that you like. Yeah. And if you and I like the same thing, there'll be more numbers in that particular point in, again, in the matrix. And then we'll be able to see that there's a correlation there. And they then, from there, they build a correlation matrix. What are the things that people like in common? And then they take a third person. They found that we liked cars and we liked some sort of music. And then they find a third person who has our background and then they show an advert that they think that we will respond to to them. Yeah. And there's all these always these spooky effects. You know, people are always telling me that they've been on Facebook and an advert has appeared about something they've just been talking about with someone. And often that is down just to this correlation that certain people are clicking on things. They have the same type of background as other people. So they start to show you adverts of, of those things. This mm. is the same kind of equation that would be used to recommend movies on Netflix or to recommend uh, products on Amazon once you've done a browse. That's all the same thing. Yes, it's, it's the same. They, they have slightly different variations. Like Netflix used a thing that was even simpler. They just basically find a copy of you. So they find, they use something called the nearest neighbor algorithm. So they have this massive database of people. They've seen what you've watched. They've seen what everyone watches and they just find the person who's most like you and just show you something and they offer you something that you haven't seen. It's incredibly simple algorithm, but it's an incredibly effective algorithm effective as well. Wow. My wife always says I have to be careful about sort of trivializing this, but this correlation equation really is the sort of thing that you learn towards the end of high school. It's just about counting the number of things in common. So you just, if you have, we have a list of people, if they like one thing and if they like another thing, we put in a one if they like it, a zero if they don't, and then we count up the pairs of ones and the pairs of zeros. So if people, if there's lots of people with zero, zero, and lots of people with one, one, then it's got a high correlation. And you just count up those people. You have to do a little bit of an adjustment for the variance, 
but then that gives you the whole advertising equation and that is basically facebook's secret so it isn't it isn't like the most comp you know it isn't the riemann hypothesis yeah. it's a basic mathematical equation which you can put everything into and, and manage to get out that that type of information so so you know something that um i, I whenever i speak to friends about it they say yeah good idea they pr should probably do it so there's all this conversation about how you know, Google and Facebook and the others own our data. They own all this metadata mm. about us that's so extraordinarily valuable. And I feel like what I want is I want YouTube to, to you know, the machines watching me, and I want YouTube to say, based on our evaluation of what you're watching, we can make mm. these predictions about you and now give me control over what to do about it. So mm. based on what you're watching, you're a... You're a you're a hardcore liberal or you're a hardcore conservative. You're this percentage likely to commit suicide or have a baby. Mm. And then and then to give me controls, you know, you look like you've got extreme right wing views. And our experience shows that people who are who's shown these kinds of content will have, you know, their views challenged. Would you like us to do that? Or would you like us to mm. reinforce your views? Give me control. You know, what do you think that would do you think that's possible? I actually think that's very possible, and that is quite close to what Twitter are quite kind of trying to do. So this is this is an idea. Actually, Stephen Wolf from the Physicist has yeah. mentioned this as an idea. Like, be told what your algorithm is, and help develop that algorithm. And yeah. Twitter are actually taking that idea quite seriously. So I think that could happen. I think it's a the difficulty is communicating it in a good way. One thing that should be noted is these algorithms might not be as accurate as people think they are. They're not going to tell you if you're going to commit suicide. Right. You know, they're not going to tell you if you're going to get a divorce. I, I looked at in a previous book, I looked at Cambridge Analytica, who were basically a sort of company of bluff artists who claim they could predict people's personalities from their Facebook. And that was kind of exaggerated. It's more that you can predict, yeah, if you're going to buy a car or not. So it's sort of advertising related things. So some so one one thing is that they're not that accurate but i think that that is going to be the future that the best companies are the ones who are going to be able to say to their customers here's the algorithm that here's you know here's a list of really good algorithms yeah. for how you can look at information uh, which one would you like to have and then what they'll be able to do is then they'll be able to tailor that and, ma and match it to certain products and magazines and things like that and exactly as you say because we often, I think all of us do this, we sit there looking at one YouTube video after another, or we sit using social media too much, and we are following the algorithm, but we feel we want to be doing something else. Yeah. And that kind of meta idea, I think, is, is going to become more and more popular. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've learned that in conversation, when I'm ready to leave a conversation, I mean, I'm sure that it's something that many people use. I, I, I will bring up, a, I'll ask the person the question, well, you know, about what they're planning to do next. So, oh, where do you plan to be at the end of the day? Or, or what was your next mm. meeting about? And, and, you know, simply planting that in their minds helps bring the meeting to an end. And in a certain way, imagine, imagine that we could program YouTube to say, if I'm watching YouTube at 11 o'clock at night, you know, um, you're going to show me five yeah. videos and then you're going to give me videos that are going to make me drowsy and going to make me think <laughs> about uh, switching off the damn computer and they're going to help me think about preparing for tomorrow. I mean, you could really use that yeah. in a positive way rather than just optimizing for more engagement endlessly and competing with other eyeball sources. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, they went and did that. I mean, I write also about this in the book that YouTube phoned up Google and told them they wanted to find, because if, if you look at YouTube maybe eight, nine years ago, the, it was it was a place you went in one once you'd watch one video it would be funny you'd laugh at it and then you'd just uh, shut it down but now you're there all the time and that's all down to one algorithm created by three guys who thought what we'll do is we'll just maximize watch time yeah that's we'll what they're optimizing for. find the videos that just keep you watching you don't care what they are and then they just got kids sitting there looking at sort of switching your heads over time and time for hours and hours They've got people watching sort of right-wing content for hours and hours and hours. And they might, you know, God knows what they're thinking when they're watching it. They might not be enjoying it. They might be irritated. And it's certainly not sending them to sleep because they're optimized for spending hours and hours and hours continue watching it. So I think that's where, I mean, that's where I really, really do love this idea that 
we can start to actually control the algorithms which control us. So yes. we can tell, we can say to YouTube that, yes, we would like to have an algorithm. I'd like to have this algorithm which sends me to sleep at a certain yeah. time. You can have my data. Just give me control over the algorithm, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so there's two places I want to go. Uh, and I'm going to try and get the, I'm going to get the both in, I'm going to get both branches mm. in, and then we'll see which branch you take. So the one branch is that it was really surprising to me. So I, I do, I have watched quite a few Jordan Peterson videos, and you bring mm. up Ben Shapiro, and I've watched quite a few Ben Shapiro videos. And I was in, very interested because you take a view that is different to Jordan Peterson, mm. which I think was really interesting. So there's one branch for you, mm. David. And then the other branch is something completely different is um, what was so mind blowing for me was, you know, so I'm watching a Coursera course on very basic computer science. And the guy shows very conclusively for me in an intuitive way how the class of computable problems is a tiny fraction of what's out there. And mm. it's not very hard to define a very simple uh, algorithm that requires infinite compute time. And so it mm. seems to me that it, it must be a branch of mathematics that you look at closely, even though you don't call yourself a computer scientist, is, you know, yeah, we can mm. solve this problem theoretically, but now we need to find a way to do it in what was, I, I want to bring up a piece of jargon, I hope you don't mind, Com P, um, no. NP complete. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so now that I've gone and thrown up all over the page, why don't we get to Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson later? Why don't you explain to the listener what I've just said in normal? Yeah, it's, it's quite incredible. You've you've sent me in like the most political direction or the or the most kind of abstract <laughs> mathematical direction that exactly. I can choose between the two. I mean, um, like I'll just I'll just start with the uh, MP complete. Actually, we've already touched on that because the traveling salesman problem is MP complete. Right. So it's exactly an example of that. So if you've got uh, 50 towns in the USA and you want to find the shortest route between all of those towns, that problem takes as much time the whole universe to calculate a foolproof answer to that to that particular um, problem they keep updating it and they've got sort of nearer and nearer to a good answer. you can get a good answer of course it's not yeah. that it's impossible to visit yeah. all the towns but if you want a, the provably best answer to that it takes an infinite amount of time and i was trying to think how can i segue from mp completeness into jordan peterson in some <laughs> sort of smooth way <laughs> yeah go I don't on know exactly have a go how i'm going to do that <laughs> i mean i think people have commented that the the book, as I've written it, it's written in a very sort of train of thought type of way that I take I, what I've tried to do. And this is on purpose that what I've tried to do is say, look, here's a mathematical equation. and It's the confidence equation in this case. Here is its use in gambling. Here is its use for thinking about if you should quit your job. And then here is its use. And this is what I'm thinking about when I'm watching Jordan Peterson, because Jordan Peterson, he has his sort of thing against political correctness and yeah. all of these things. And but what he does is he does this thing that I don't think is fair. He says that he is the empirical scientific guy coming here and he's fighting against these people who are sort of fluffy, like um, they're, they're working in the humanities and they're not sort of serious like he is and he's a serious scientist. And the reason I don't think it's fair is because he doesn't look at the quantitative research in these types of things. So if I take one example to do with gender discrimination, because this is what he came up with, so what what they do in these in these subjects now, of course, there's a lot of fluffy gender theory or whatever, but they do some extremely empirical studies. So they they did a study in Germany where they show a job description of a woman, a, a, a job description of a person yeah. and, and a person might be a woman and a job description of a, a person who's a man. And then they ask people, how much do you think this person should be paid? And they show them loads and loads of these things with yeah. different types of backgrounds. And they find that people say that the man should be paid or the woman should be paid 95 cents to the dollar that the man is paid so the woman should be paid less but if you ask them do you think women should be paid less than men they say no 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 way that you know that's for the same work a man should be paid as a woman and so you can actually do an empirical demonstration that people do implicitly discriminate so yep. this isn't some sort of fluffy idea absolutely this is the empiricism and what he does with his personality and all of those types of things, that is the fluffy science. That sounds very empirical when he presents it, 
but when you actually look into it, it's based on these incredibly weak correlations, which you would never take seriously. So he is doing stuff which is sort of, ne it's not pseudoscience, I wouldn't go quite that far, but it's right at the kind of um, softest end of the science. While when you look at people who are studying any of these issues around discrimination and so on, they are doing some of the hardest science. So I think, and, and it's not entirely Jordan Peterson's fault because I hardly ever see the hard side of this type of gender discrimination and racial discrimination come out. It's often the task of explaining it for some reason is often given to people from the humanities and it doesn't have that empirical basis. But when you actually look at the research, there's study after study. I mean, I could go on about them. There's ones about yeah. CVs sent into different jobs and you send in the CVs and, and they say, oh, you know, we should employ these women more often than the men or we should employ a Swedish sounding person named person instead of a Muslim sounding name person. These discriminations are actually real and happen every day. Uh, have you ever considered writing to him and suggesting that you debate with him? Because, I, I mean, I think that, I mean, one thing that you and he share in common is that mm. you're very empirical. And um, so, so you're calling out a bias there in him. And I think that he would love to debate it and it would be mm. fun. I would li certainly listen to any podcast that's got you and him talking about this issue. And I think he'd be pretty open to it, actually. Yeah, I think I think he would. I mean, we, we have the same publisher, so I should really uh, <laughs> sort of push them on this this particular thing. I mean, I don't know. The, the thing was, actually, when um, Jordan Peterson was was ill as well. And yeah. so I think yeah. that's one of the reasons that um, I haven't really sort of pushed this idea because um, it doesn't you know, he I, I don't think he was feeling so well after things. But it's certainly nothing I'd have. You know, that that's something I would have nothing against doing i i would actually quite enjoy uh debating with some of these uh people but they never invite me onto their podcast so i'll see you know if if, actually, if they invite me onto their podcast then i'm i'm completely up for it i i love talking about these things well maybe maybe jordan's listening to this way. podcast you know so jordan if you're on this podcast <laughs> yes. you've just heard david sumter professor of <laughs> mathematics in sweden in um i i was going to say lund but it's not in lund it's Uppsala. Is, no, it's uh, Uppsala. Yes. We're, the, we're the oldest university. You know, yes. London's the pretender. So, Jordan, it's well worth speaking to David Sumter. I would listen to that, I promise you. <laughs> but um, uh, where was I going to go next here? There's um, so much. Yeah, I was going to go to an equation that is not in there that is called the Kelly rule. I don't know if you've come across the Kelly formula. Mm. Yes. Yeah, well, you'll explain it better than I can. So why don't you explain to the listener what the Kelly formula is? And Whoa, <laughs> now you're putting me... I have, I have written about it. I wrote about it in my first book, Softomatics. I wrote about... Um, I mean, it's, it's basically to do with... So when you have an advantage, so when you have a betting model and you have a particular edge, that you, your model predicts that you're going to win um, by a certain margin then it tells you how big a bet you should place on those on that particular um, bias. And the, the result comes from information theory, as you have some extra information over somebody else, and this is how much more information you have. And the more information you have, the more you should bet on it. And yeah. it's basically the logarithm of the information tells you how much extra you should, you should place on that bet. So, uh, you know, I live in the investing world, and... Um... When I first read it, it was a book by William Poundstone, Fortune's Formula, is what mm. he calls it. And he talks about a character who had figured out how to get an edge on a casino, possibly in blackjack. And mm. um, so it was a question of how much he should be betting in order to maximize his return before he got thrown out. <laughs> and um, so all of us investors were all excited because we felt like this was a formula to help us decide how much we should bet in any particular situation what proportion of the portfolio mm. that might work in a well-defined statistically or um, uh, you know a, a fundamentally defined set of probabilities. But if you don't really know those probabilities, you can because because we live in a reality that you know we can only sample reality and we don't know if the sample is representative or not. Mm. Then it doesn't work. So I kind of discarded it, you know. Uh, I discarded it as and, a guide and to my Actually, action. it's really interesting because I, I think that you're right to do that. That was that was a that's a really good point because, and it comes back to where we sort of started with applications. 
I think often theoretical people forget about exactly the point you made, that you it's based on some kind of assumption. If you've got some sort of edge that you know that you've got in blackjack or, or whatever game that you're playing at, then you, you must have, I don't know how they got the edge in the first place. So you're probably going to lose if you're playing. But if you've got some sort of edge that you know you've got and you want to optimize the time you should do, then that's exactly right. But in finance, it's different. And in almost every other application, it's different. You know, I work in football betting sometimes and it's different there as well because we don't know what the true model is. So we don't know the size of where edge is. And so we can use Ke the Kelly criteria to place our bets, but we can't really be sure that our model is correct. And so I think I normally actually, when I'm betting on football, I use fixed size bets. So I don't use right. the, the Kelly, Kelly and, criteria at all. You know, because of this, exactly what you said, that we don't know what the underlying model is. Exactly. Um, so I've met Tony Bloom a couple of times. And uh, I was actually, I'm not a okay. soccer fan, but I was actually invited to a game down at Brighton Hove and Albion. And so he was there. He's, okay. I think he's the owner. And um, that that's a fascinating world, I have to say. Um, mm. I'm not, I, I, that, that, you know, I, I could, that's a whole rabbit hole that even not knowing a lot about soccer, I could dive into. And you've clearly spent yeah. an awful lot of time around people who think about soccer. And I enjoyed the uh, Markov I, I've never, you know, that's a whole other area of mathematics. And a whole other question mm -hmm. that I have for you is, it's so interesting that you're a, an applied mathematician, and um, but you've stayed away from economics. So a lot of math, you know, economics mm -hmm. now is, but a place where I do want to go is Bayes' theorem. I, I, I think that, you know, Bayesian probability ought to be taught in high school to all children. You should not be allowed, to, like, I don't think you should graduate high school without knowing what double entry bookkeeping is. <laughs> And you know the, the the it's it's the kind of like the the riddle that you're told all these times, which is all about base rates. So even if you you know if you have mm. a positive result on a test of something that has a very low base rate, I mean that's my simplistic understanding of Bayes' theorem. Mm. You have to take into account the very low incidence in the population, and so the fact that you tested po positive in say an AIDS test, in it, you very mm. likely that you'll you're it's a less than fifty percent chance that you actually have AIDS because of the low base rate even if the test's pretty good. You know, I, and I, I am pretty convinced that if I wanted to improve my ability to evaluate the world uh, and to take in, so I'm taking in facts about the world every day and I have to be making probabilistic assumptions of whether that is a reflection of reality or how likely that is to mm. be a reflection of reality. And I actually think that, you know, what I need to do is do like a, a good sort of two solid weeks worth of problem sets in Bayes' theorem. And I think that it would probably improve my decision making. Um, has anybody come to you with that proposition before? I think, I, I think, you're, I think you're right. I mean, I think the, the basic way to look at it is to, I, I like to, so after I wrote the book, I, I did a bit about in the book, I write this square which I very much like. It's the it's the possibility of all different outcomes. Yes. And what you do is you then say you then so it, it might be if the plane is going to crash or the plane is not going to crash. And there you have for the plane going to crash, you have a really, really tiny square of it really going to crash. And then you say, is the plane shaking? And you then have a larger strip on that uh, yes. in this square where the plane can be shaking. And then you say, well, OK, there's this area over here where the plane is not shaking and is not going to crash. We'll rule out. But then you look to see this tiny dot inside the strip of all the times the plane might shake. And you see, well, that's still a very, very tiny dot. So I'm on this plane. It's shaking and it's probably not going to crash. Right. And I think that there's a, a visual way of, of portraying Bayes' theorem where you don't really need to say that it's a theorem because it sounds a bit scary, maybe. You know, you say, let's let's teach it at school and they say that they're going to get our Bayes' theorem. Yeah. It sounds a bit scary. But if you start to actually teach probability in terms of drawing a Venn diagram or a square of different possible outcomes, this can happen, that can happen. Yeah. I think that that can be a very useful way for people to think about probability. Yeah. I think the problems go even deeper. For example, I mean, a common test problem that I try with my students in first year at university as I say there's a competition so th this is a, a thing that I, I saw when I was younger but you, there was a, co a coke can competition you open a can of coke and you have one in six chance of winning a prize what's the probability if you open six cans of coke 
what's the probability that you win the prize? And people find this difficult because they think, well, yeah, it might be it's like six times one sixth. Yeah, I'm, I'm guaranteed to win the prize if I open six of these. But then they think they can't be guaranteed to win the prize. How does that work? And what the trick for that particular problem is that you take this five sixth chance of not winning each time. So you do five sixths to the power of six. And then you take one minus that tells you the probability that you will win one time. So just that turning the problem on its head, saying, look, this is the probability of not winning. And then taking one minus that takes you the probability that you will win at least at least one time. And those types of problems, I, I find that even university students can't answer them. And they're so sort of fundamental to the decisions that we make. You know, it brings me to an article, a leader, actually, I think, in The Economist, the Economist, sometimes they make me very angry and sometimes I think they do some incredibly original short pieces. But this was probably from a piece of research, which basically somebody had found a way of normalizing mathematical achievement across different countries and different examination systems and different teaching systems to kind of get a real comparability between different countries and then they just looked at, you know, measures like income per capita across mathematical ability. And, you know, th there's another part of your mm. book where you talk about causation. And I'm not trying to talk. Well, I, I guess I am talking causation where I can't <laughs> prove that it exists. But I very, very strongly believe, I believe it, I'm not saying it's true, mm. that somehow thinking about these things makes us richer and they show that the, it, there's a correlation between mathematical achievement within countries and across countries in terms of income it's just a, this extraordinarily powerful thing that uh like bay and and okay don't call it base theorem call it probability venn diagrams <laughs> and 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 so you know not that i want to let's just touch on another unbelievably um controversial topic at least in some places I suspect, here's, here's a nice study to do, if it's possible, is mathematical ability and vaccination hesitancy. I kind of sit with people, so, so, so maybe you can unpack this for the listener. So the way I see it, there's only two doors you can go through. You can go through, you know, one way or another, the virus is going to find you. So you can either wait in an mm. unprepared state, let the virus infect you, and take your chances on either recovering or dying, or you can take your chances with the vaccine. And we know, you know, I, my mm. rough numbers are that the probability of adverse effects from the vaccine are about one in a million. And uh, even those, all of the adverse effects are not going to lead to death. The probability of death from the virus is about one in a thousand. I mean, it depends on so many different factors. And there mm. is a real chance of death. And I don't understand why when you present that and you present that to somebody and I know a couple of people who are vaccine hesitant or anti-vax even, you say that is the reality. I, mm. my, what my point to you and I'm curious to hear a response is that they are mathematically challenged because otherwise mm. you'd see the logic of that. Well, what have I gotten wrong? No, well, it's, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? I think, I think though, sometimes, and of course, you know, I'm not going to try and you against the logic of this i'm just going to try try and take the perspective of somebody like that and i think sometimes people just don't get round to doing things and can't be bothered to do things and it is doing something and they they find it difficult to actually get round and do something so then afterwards they make up an explanation about why they didn't do it so it's very appealing to them to have this sort of anti-vax information so they're kind of reluctant to do something and they have a sort of tendency to not want to do something. And then they not really bothered about these one in thousand and one in a million yeah. type of uh, reasoning because they just don't think it's going to happen to them in particular. Yeah, th those kind of probabilities don't really mean anything to them. I'm kind of wary about, of course, to me, it's like illogical in this way. There's no sort of logical explanation how you when you you kind of line up one in a million versus one in a thousand but at the same time there's a kind of it's a sort of different way of thinking i think and um i think that it's just that's just how it is so i'm i'm, I'm not in any way justifying vaccine yeah. hesitancy but, um, but, but i do think that it's a different approach to life and one thing you shouldn't forget is that 
in many cases, that type of approach to life will make you very happy. If you just go around thinking about the probabilities of everything happening all of the time, you can actually yeah. get very sad from that type of approach. You can get very worried about the world and you can get very concerned about everything. So you should sort of, whenever you see somebody doing something strange like that, you should lift up and see their perspective of the entire world, I think. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm trying my best yeah, to, yeah. to help well, that person out, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting anywhere. Well, but but well, that, two that's things. what I try to do. Yeah, one is uh, it brings up this idea of trolleyology. You know, um, the uh, the morality mm. of just being a, a passive bystander and pulling a lever. And even if, you know, and, and mm. you, you and I could come and say yes, but you're saving three lives. Yeah, so mm. for the listener, you know, you, we got the train on the tracks and there's three people on one track that are about to die if you do nothing. And But if you divert the train, then you're only going to kill one person. Many people will not divert the train. Uh, because they feel like mm. once they've diverted it, they're somehow morally culpable, even if technically they've saved two lives. So your point is that these are people who are living their lives in such a way that they want to let the natural thing unfold without interfering and will take those consequences effectively. And they yes, I, th I think I think you're, now you're it's good. I, I was kind of resistant against taking up my argument in the book, but now you're taking it out for me because <laughs> that's that's exactly that's exactly the way I would argue for that person that there's a sort of set of beliefs that you have and a set of ways that you see the world and you have for dealing with these problems and they're a kind of like well let let things happen to me yeah. uh, way of seeing the world which in many many senses might actually i wouldn't say it was rational but it might be a reasonably self-consistent view of the world to, yeah. to say i'll just let things happen to me and then when you ask them you know and you tell them those numbers and they have they start to try and defend it because they're trying to argue with you in, in your interpretation of the world. And of course, they fail on your on the way that you deal with the world. But within themselves, they have a consistent yeah. way of, of dealing with the world, which which they're applying. Another way of looking at that is I have an uncle who, who died of uh, colon cancer. And when I heard that he had colon cancer, I, of course, was doing all the research, best cancer mm. center in the world, best probabilities of survival. And he just went to a hospice and he had a very nice end mm. of his life. In a, and that's a similar kind of idea, let things take their course. I think mm. what I want to do is, th this is so much fun, it could go on for hours, is that mm. uh, I hope to engage with you on a later date, at least through problem sets in one way or another. Mm. I don't know if you <laughs> <laughs> something, I don't know what. Maybe I should apply mm. to do your course or something. <laughs> I... I uh, I don't have enough mathematics in my life, and it's just super mm. fun to talk to somebody who thinks the way you do, and I think we need more of it in the world, and I appreciate what you do, and I appreciate your book, and if I was 20, I'd be applying for your course, and maybe you'd accept <laughs> it, who knows. Not all my courses, but just now, I think my statistical machine learning course, for example, which covers some of the things in the book, uh, is available online. And there's quite a lot of problems there that you could work through right. in, your, if you're, in your spare time. It's true. We, we didn't get... Other people want to work through. But I'm actually very aware of the fact that something I really want to sort out is a website for, for exactly this type of thing. And I think it takes a bit of work and it requires some financing, but that's what we're looking into just now so that we're going to have some sort of 10 equations website in the near future. Yeah, well, feel free to... We can connect offline and we can discuss further... And, and as would only be fair in one of these conversations, first of all, thank you so much for your time. Your time is very, very valuable. And so I appreciate you giving some of it to me and to whoever <laughs> tunes into this podcast. <laughs> and um, other than this fantastic 10 Equations website that's going to go up, uh, if people want to engage with you and they don't qualify for a course at Uppsala University, what's the best way to find you? And how do you like engaging with the general public? No, I mean, I love engaging with the general public. I mean, I went on a total swing. So I was sort of like, for most of my career, I wasn't so interested at all in communicating about what I did. Then about five years ago, I just kind of went under undergo a complete change. And so now I, I spend a lot of time on Twitter talking to people and discussing these types of um, things. So Twitter is probably the best place to yeah, find me. Actually, I haven't found I think maybe I did find you on Twitter. I don't even remember where I found you. That reminds me of um, 
Another applied mathematician, I don't know if you've had any contact with somebody called Ole Peters. No. This is this, uh, and I'm not going to explain it very well, but he has a kind of, he's part of the Mathematical Society of London, maybe, or the Mathematical Institute of London, and um, okay. the LMU, London Mathematical mm. Institute. Um, he's taken an idea from gases called ergodicity, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to you know, mangle this very badly, but... It comes down for me in investing that you can have something that has a positive expected return, but if you keep applying it, you'll still end up at zero. So, th so the example would be half the time you get you're, you're down forty percent, and half the time you're up forty percent, and you just follow mm. that in a spreadsheet. And the expected return is like one point oh five, if I got the numbers right. But if you follow that mm. in a spreadsheet, you'll eventually get to zero, basically, because you just... Yeah, I think one of the, one of the examples is this Martingale example where you put, you double your money on black every time, and then your sort of expected return is positive because you're doubling money on black. But if you've got, you've got to have an infinite amount of money to continue with that. That's, I don't know if that's, that's related that, to the same... Uh, that's a, a similar system. idea. But the, the bottom line is it turns out that the way we calculate probability in... And this is terrible because I ought to, I mean, I, I ought to be living this stuff. I ought to be able to explain it to you. I should have mugged up on it beforehand. <laughs> Why am I coming up with this to you is that I came across this material and I'll send it to you right afterwards and I'll add it in the notes. I, and I think that just to come back to the point, so, so readers, you can find David on Twitter or listeners and I'll certainly post that. But the point of the book and your point to me and the listeners is that there is a lot of very straightforward and simple mathematics that will enable us to mm. make far better decisions in the world. And the opportunities to apply simple, straightforward mathematics are abound. And so I think that's part of my excitement to talk to you. And that's part of why what you do is so important, actually. We will be a better mm. world. Well, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of like extending this a little bit. And, and to get mm -hmm. off the ergodicity idea, which I didn't explain very well, mm -hmm. you know, the simple and fascinating idea that when you have institutions of higher learning, again, incomes rise. And the exact process mm -hmm. by which that happens is not clear in my mind. I mean, I happen to live in Zurich, and Zurich makes, does a really good job of, of investing its in, in its institutions of higher education. I'm certain that correlates to income. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I can't show you causation. <laughs> I can give you <laughs> theories of causation, but I can't prove it. I don't know if you want to respond to that and correct my wayward I, errors. I think there probably is some sort of causal arrow there as well. We looked at we we looked at this once. Certainly, is with healthcare and things like this that once you it's it really is money that drives has driven a lot of the development in, for example, healthcare. So I think it probably would be the same in in education as well. But I suppose the problem is, of course, driving the finance in different countries as well right. because i think you have to get rich first and then i mean th this goes back to one of the things that inspired me to do public communication was hans Rosling's work where it, this gap minder right. things right. with the bubbles that would go up the, the screen and the ted talk and and so on so that idea that we're sort of getting richer and everything is getting better i'm still convinced by that in lots of ways yes. and i think that that's just going to continue David, thank okay. you so much for agreeing to come on this podcast. Well, and uh, It's been very interesting discussion in lots of different directions.